The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a woman asking about membership of a society. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi. I'd like some information about joining the International Arts Society. That's no problem. What exactly can I help you with? First of all, I'd like to know about the membership fee. Well, there are two types of membership. Can you tell me what they are? First, there is lifetime membership, which means that you can have access to all the facilities at the Society itself and all exhibitions. Plus, you can have discounts to various events at affiliated arts organisations here and abroad. And on top of that, you can use the lifetime members' room. How much is that type of membership? Well, the lifetime membership fee is £1,537. Hmm. OK. It's rather a lot to pay in one go. Uh, what about the other membership? The ordinary membership, that's £193 per year. That sounds a bit more reasonable. Um, what does that entitle you to? You can visit the Society, including the exhibitions, the library, and follow the arts programmes on weekdays during the opening times from 10am to 9pm and at the weekend between 10am and 5pm. On Saturday, if there's a special event like a lecture or restricted showing of an exhibition, then it opens until 9pm. So, what is the difference between this and the lifetime membership. In the long run, you save money as you're making a one-off payment and you have exclusive use of the lifetime members' room. OK. Mm. What arts programmes do you run? Well, the Society has a very extensive programme to cater for all tastes. There's a series of exhibition rooms for the permanent collection of paintings, watercolours and sculpture. And then there's a new exhibition area which opened at the beginning of the year. And we run a series of courses and lectures to go with the exhibitions. Can I ask about the lectures? What is scheduled for this year? The latest list is in this leaflet. Oh, yes. That looks very good. Are all the exhibitions, etc., free if I join? Yes, everything is free. That's fair enough. I think in that case I'll join. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I just need to take your name, address and telephone number. First, your name. Margaret Rochester. I take it that's R-O-C-H-E-S-T-E-R? -E -E yes, that's it. And the address? It's 55 Stone Avenue. OK. Avenue. And the postcode? Mm, let's see. It's MA7-4PQ. 
And a daytime telephone number. Can I give you my work number? Yeah, that's fine. It's 0207 895 2220 and the extension is 6633. Can I pay by credit card? Yes, of course. Do you want to pay for the full year at one time or by monthly instalments? You pay £4 extra a month if you pay by instalments. OK. I think I'll pay by monthly instalments. Right. If you just complete this form, then we can set up the monthly payments. OK. If you just put your PIN number in the machine, I can deduct the first month's payment. Right. That's gone through. Here's your card. I now just need to take your photograph over here and then I can put it on your membership card. OK. That's it. I'll just print out your membership card. Right. Here you are. Thank you. By the way, can I bring any friends to the Society exhibitions and lectures? With the ordinary membership, we can issue a day pass once a fortnight, which allows you to bring a friend in. But you have to accompany them. Thank you. Can I go in now? Yes. You just swipe your card here. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Bestley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost, so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens. If you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There's a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. 
We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is £6.50 for adults, with a 10% discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of 16 pay half adult price and under 8 go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there is also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, where you can watch old-fashioned nights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle, as if you were a guest of King Henry VIII himself. There are several concerts planned this year too, including a rock concert at an admission price of £10 per person and a special jazz concert which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual Haunted Castle event at the end of October where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November 5th, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. The charity event held every year on the first day of May will this year be an archery contest. Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year, will be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people, age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the Tourist Information Desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3 You will hear a talk given by a lecturer to a group of civil engineering students on the reed bed system for sewage treatment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about what is now called the reed bed sewage treatment system. This system uses naturally occurring reeds to treat domestic and industrial waste. It's an environmentally friendly alternative to normal systems. You all know what reeds are like, don't you? those tall plants with hollow stems that grow in wet places, like marshes, for example. Here's how the system works. First of all, an artificial marsh is created. To do this, holes are dug about one metre deep and usually rectangular in shape. 
They are then lined with clay or plastic and the liner is covered with gravel. After that, a system of tubing is laid with holes in it and more gravel is added to cover that. Finally, reeds are planted in the bed. The sewage is brought to settling tanks. From there, it is distributed to the roots of the reeds through the tubing. Note that the waste material enters the beds underground and remains underground. The reeds conduct oxygen very efficiently through their stems to the roots system. Here, bacteria work to reduce the waste material to basic elements. What comes out of the artificial marsh is water that has been cleaned through a natural process. The purified water leaves the reed bed through a simple outflow pipe. The water that comes out has to be tested. Sometimes it's held in a pond until it evaporates or soaks into the ground. Sometimes, after testing, the water is discharged directly into streams and rivers. Before the talk continues, with questions from the students... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. The reed bed system originated in Germany in the 1970s and installations have been built in a number of countries throughout the world. To give you an idea of the size and appearance of a reed bed installation, an area of 3 by 5 metres approximately would be adequate for a single house. It would look like a pond overgrown with reeds. There are cities with 150,000 people in Germany whose entire sewage treatment requirements are served by reed bed installations which extend for 10 to 20 hectares. There are two wonderful environmental advantages. First of all, reed bed systems are natural composters. As time passes, high-grade soil builds up in the beds. The soil can be removed and used for agricultural purposes. Soil produced from waste containing heavy metals would of course have to be tested and the toxic material removed by chemical processes. An additional advantage is that the reed bed can function exactly as a marsh providing a healthy natural home or habitat for waterfowl and other birds, insects, reptiles and mammals. But there are practical advantages to a reed bed system over existing sewage treatment plants as well. At all levels, the cost is lower than for normal systems. Labour costs are a fraction of the costs of a conventional system. Typically, a large-scale reed bed installation will cost 10% less than a mechanical system. They require little maintenance, and unlike mechanical systems, the efficiency of reed beds increases over time. But before we go any further, you must have some questions. Maybe this sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. If these systems have so many benefits, why aren't they more popular? Why don't we see them everywhere? As I said, the technology is now almost 40 years old. Demonstration projects of all types have been built and monitored and are slowly convincing regulators of the advantages of the system. But you have to understand that regulating authorities are by nature conservative and resist change. Typically, there's a lot of opposition to these systems by manufacturers and by everyone involved in maintaining the conventional systems. Reed bed systems require fewer staff to operate, so there would be a decline in the workforce. Therefore, unions would resist the change as well. What happens to reed beds in winter? Does the efficiency decrease? The above ground part of the plants die back in cold weather but the roots remain alive and active and the system continues to work just as effectively in winter. As soon as the weather warms up new reeds appear and grow quickly. Is there a problem with mosquitoes in these ponds? Well they're not exactly ponds with standing water. 
The beds look more like a field covered with long grass. The soil is moist, but not like a swamp, so there would be no more mosquitoes than in any other field. Remember, the effluent enters the beds underground and remains underground. OK, let's get into some of the technical details now, and I'll answer questions as they come up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture on international trade, I'm going to look at the issue of protectionism. I'll start off with a definition of protectionism and then go on to look at the methods countries have used to protect their economy. Following this, I'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of protectionism when compared to free and open trade. So let's define protectionism. Protectionism at its simplest is the opposite of free trade. It is the practice of protecting domestic industries from foreign competition by using import duties or quotas. Options available to protect the economy are tariffs, embargoes, subsidies and quotas. Let's examine these in turn with some examples. Tariffs are one form of protectionism. It is a tax which is applied to imported goods, but not to home-produced goods. The idea is to make the imported goods more expensive than the home-produced ones, so that consumers buy home-produced items. An ongoing example of protectionism via tariff is between Britain and the USA. Britain buys most of its bananas from Commonwealth countries, largely in the Caribbean. However, the USA owns banana plantations in South America. In 1999, Britain refused to buy bananas from South America, so the US government put tariffs on some British-produced goods. The most famous example was a tariff of 100% import tax on wool products from Scotland brought into the United States. The next method of protectionism is embargoes. An embargo is a complete ban on the import of certain goods. For example, following the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s, the USA banned the import of Cuban cigars. Unfortunately, Cuban cigars are the finest in the world, and there is consequently a thriving black market in Cuban cigars in the USA. As we can see in the example, embargoes can lead to a black market, or unofficial economy if people want the goods badly enough. Subsidies are a way governments support industries at home with money or tax breaks in order to allow them to compete better with foreign companies. In 1994, the French government provided its national airline with a £2 billion subsidy in order to help it compete with low-cost airlines. However, Subsidies can have the effect of making home producers uncompetitive and inefficient. Finally, let's look at quotas. A quota system allows a certain quantity of goods to be imported from other countries. 
The European Union has had quotas on textiles and clothing for decades to protect its textile industries from developing countries, especially India and China. Understandably, developing countries say that this is unfair and against the principles of free trade. Let's move on now to the arguments for and against protectionism. For trade to flourish between countries, the benefits from trade need to be equally balanced. Where a country feels that it's not getting a fair share of the trade, or that it is somehow disadvantaged, it might employ one or more of the methods of protection. There are at least four arguments that may be given for using protectionism. Firstly, to protect employment in the home country. The simple view is that if imports are stopped, then jobs will be saved and even created at home. Secondly, to prevent unfair competition. It is often said that developing countries have the advantage of cheap labour costs in their countries and that they use this to undercut the price of the same goods produced in richer nations. A tariff might be applied to even out this imbalance. Thirdly, to protect new industries. A new industry, particularly one in a developing country, might not be able to compete with long-established industries elsewhere. Tariffs and quotas give new industries the chance to build up production to the point where they can compete. Fourthly, to raise money. Tariffs were once used as a way of raising revenue for the government. In modern countries, they are now seldom used for this purpose, as the damage to trade often outweighs any immediate benefits. Now for the arguments against protectionism, which are perhaps simpler to summarise. Although trade restrictions might help a country for a short period of time, their overall effect is a negative one. Restrictions affect the flow of trade, and the more countries employ restrictions, the less trade can flow. In the long run, no one benefits from trade restriction, because if one country puts restrictions on another country, the other country then puts their own restrictions on the first country. This affects the first country's exports, and as the country finds it difficult to export goods, then unemployment is the result. So, protection tends to help only the protected, and can hide inefficient manufacturers. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.